<laughs> How are you? Hello. Hi, Daniel. <laughs> thank, thank you very you much. Hear me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Thank you very Great much you. for accepting the interview. Great. You know? I, My pleasure. Yeah. My I, pleasure. I always wear a coat and tie at home, you know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have a lot of questions. <laughs> so it's half an hour, okay, it's not one hour, no? Okay. I wanted to ask you the first because um, you're called the, like the Nazi hunter. I don't, I don't know, do you like this expression or it's a little bit, a little bit too, um, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't like it. So mm. it, that's a great question to start with. Um, uh, it, it, uh, makes it seem as this uh, as this work is a sport, um, or it's uh, something that amateurs can do, uh, when in fact this is very very serious, very complex, often uh, heartbreaking uh, 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 professional uh, law enforcement work. What's your key uh, motivation to do did uh, to do this job? Well, um, I wasn't planning to do this work. Uh, I often uh, quote uh, uh, John Lennon, uh, late of the Beatles, who once said, life is what happens while you're making other plans. So I had um, been expecting to go into business. I went to uh, best business, undergraduate business school in America, uh, the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. I stayed there and got my uh, master's uh, in business administration. So I had two degrees in finance. I taught finance there as a grad student. <laughs> and then on a lark, I went to law school and I thought, yeah, no, legal training would help me in business. And in my first year, I volunteered uh, uh, in a student group that helped uh, local, uh, local prosecutors. And I was assigned uh, to do legal research on a rape case. And it was a, a horrific uh, case, and terribly frightening. I mean, it was terribly frightening for me even to read about it. You know, and I obviously hadn't experienced it. Uh, and uh, I, it was a challenging uh, uh, legal issue, and we prevailed on it. And I remember feeling very good that we had been able to secure some measure of justice on behalf of the victim. And I had never thought about a career in law, and certainly not a career in prosecution, but that opened my eyes uh, to the value of that kind of public service. And well, if you want to prosecute uh, cases, you want typically the most serious cases that you can prosecute. And you would be hard pressed to find cases more serious than, you know, Nazi crimes. But so I I'm think lucky. that you also had a, um, a motivation because of your father, don't you? Yes, yeah. Um, the, um, the Hol I, mean, I come from a Jewish family. And the Holocaust was not discussed in my home. Uh, it was, uh, I realize now, obviously just too sensitive, too close to the war when I was growing up in the 1960s. Uh, uh, my father and my mother uh, uh, were escapees from uh, Germany in, in, in the late 1930s. They're not Holocaust, they were not Holocaust survivors. Uh, my father came to uh, the United States and went immediately into his senior year of high school and uh, uh, then into the United States Army a few years later um, and um, uh, was sent to North Africa and uh, uh, to uh, Europe. And uh, in the uh, uh, last uh, days of the war, uh, in April of 1945, um, when uh, Dachau concentration camp was liberated, he uh, and two other men were sent to the camp uh, because word had spread quickly in the region that something terrible was found there and my dad's commanding officer uh, ordered these three men to go there, see what it was and report back. I learned of this when I was about 14 when uh, uh, I was talking with my dad about his military service and mostly he told me interesting and sometimes even humorous stories, you know, one time he boxed for his unit, that kind of thing. And then suddenly he told me, you know, I um, was sent to Dachau concentration camp the day ever after its liberation. And I, I knew a little bit about uh, the Second World War, so I knew what Dachau was. Uh, and uh, I said, well, what did you see? And my father tried to tell me, uh, but his eyes welled with tears and he got all choked up and he never could tell me. Uh, that was the first time I ever saw my, my father cry.
you never asked your father again about Dachau and all this situation? No. Interesting, no. Um, uh, uh, my father lived uh, until uh, 2007, and we did speak about my work. He was interested in it, you know, um, but we never uh, went back to that subject. I, uh, I knew that was too painful. And I, it changed my father forever. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure of that. And did he speak about uh, this, this uh, event with your mother or somebody else? No, no, never mentioned it to him. Hmm. Yeah, uh, and I think he also inter interviewed uh, like um, um, several people as well. No, it was not only Dachau. No, he Leni Riefenstahl and so on. No. Oh, no. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, after the war, uh, my father, because he had German language capability, uh, was uh, sent to the Seventh Army Interrogation Center where they questioned uh, uh, a lot of what we would today call high value prisoners, among them uh, Lenny Riefenstahl, I don't know how high value she really was, and my father ended up being fairly sympathetic uh, to her situation, uh, but not uh, for most others, and some of those people actually ended up being tried at Nuremberg. Mm. So, so it's kind of a family history. Yeah, 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 I think so. My question is also, uh, now, um, why is it too, so important to um, to find these people? Because I, I I saw an interview with you that you were, were saying that sometimes you were like obsessed finding these people and saying, oh, I have to find them and uh, working weekends and so on. Is it like this? Is it a little bit, you need to be, a, why, why was it so important for you? I don't think obsession is the word, but what we were very conscious of was the, the, the time pressure of the work. Already when, when we started in, in 1979, we were told, work as fast as you responsibly can because these people are dying, they're old. And in fact, many of them uh, 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 did die uh, in the ensuing years, and some of them we found had, had died long before our office was established. So the time pressures uh, were, were um, really almost unbearable and that's why i left after a few years came back later as a as a as a deputy um not as a, a trial attorney uh it's important it's very important to pursue these cases to send a message uh to the would-be uh, perpetrators of of human rights crimes in the future that if they dare to uh, take part in such crimes that what remains of the civilized world will pursue them um uh, for as long as it takes, even into old age. So it's, it's mostly about deterrence. It's also about uh, securing some justice on behalf of victims. Of course, um, the, the survivors of the Holocaust and other Nazi crimes who've testified in our court cases are the heroes of this work. You know, people who are willing to, in a sense, relive the horrors that they experienced. Um, uh, so that a, a judge can begin to understand the reality of, of these crimes. We, we owe that to them. When you, and uh, can you tell me, um, how is the process, uh, you know, how is the process going in, normally with the steps and how, does it, uh, how long does it take? These cases uh, uh, typically take years to, to investigate and fully prosecute. Uh, and of course, as, as time goes on, uh, uh, the, the, the probability of bringing a case like this and, and then winning it in court uh, shrinks. And in the year 2021, we are almost out of time. If uh, anyone had told me five years ago even, that in 2020, I would be in court cross-examining um, uh, uh, someone who was involved in <clears throat> Nazi uh, acts of persecution, which is our legal standard, crimes against humanity. In effect, I would have said, no way, 2021, no. But that's what happened. So normally, how, the, how, um, yeah. <clears throat> there's a no. uh, There's a Hollywood conception of, of this work uh, exemplified by the, uh, or best exemplified perhaps by the movie Marathon Man from the 1970s starring Sir Lawrence Olivier 
and Dustin Hoffman and in the climactic scenes of, of that movie, um, uh, the Nazi character comes up from Latin America. He's spotted on the street by an elderly uh, woman survivor. I, I wish I remembered the actress's name, brilliant performance. Um, and she uh, calls out his name and gives chase and others give chase or another person gives chase. And it's very dramatic. Uh, uh, that's great cinema. The reality is very different. Uh, in, in general, our cases have originated in uh, a process that we began in the early 1980s. Uh, at that time, unique in the world. Uh, we um, had brought on board to our small office uh, uh, historians, mostly young historians who spoke German and other languages that we needed, and they were um, experienced in, in modern European history, uh, and in particular, uh, the history of the Third Reich. And uh, when they were doing their researches in archives uh, in Europe and elsewhere, we told them to keep an eye open for the surviving remnant of Nazi personnel records and wanted lists and the like. And then they, when they brought those names and birth dates, we hoped that sometimes we had to search for birth dates. Uh, when they brought that all back to Washington, we started methodically comparing those names and birth dates against um, US immigration and other records to see if we could find matches. And sure enough, we did. Uh, sometimes they were false hits, you know, someone with the same name and a similar birth date or even an identical birth date. Uh, but other times it was the quote unquote right person. And then the investigation uh, would, would really begin in earnest. I often say that uh, in a typical criminal investigation, you go from the crime, right? You have a, a dead body, say, at 42nd and Broadway in Manhattan. You go from the crime scene to the perpetrator. You try to find out who, who did that crime, who committed it. Uh, uh, in our work, typically, we've done the reverse. We've gone from the suspected criminal to the crimes. So the challenge for us is we have a person, and we know what unit that person served in, and we know what the unit did. But what did that person do? And you know, um, uh, since most of our defendants are have been, but not all, most have been pretty far down the um, down the, uh, the the hierarchy. You know, they weren't uh, leaders; uh, they were, you know, the trigger puller types. Um, uh, it's it's particularly challenging to uh, ascertain exactly what they did at the remove of of decades. On the other side of you know the Atlantic Ocean here in the United States, um, uh, when you're talking also about crimes that were committed uh, in a manner that was intended uh, very often to eliminate physically all the people who, had they survived, might have been inclined to cooperate uh, in a government investigation, uh, and also in the closing days of the war when the uh, Nazis, um, the SS in particular, realized that all was lost. They burned huge quantities of, of uh, incriminating documents. In the case that we uh, just secured a deportation in the Berger case, after winning it in, in court uh, uh, last year and on appeal this year, uh, uh, he served at, at a camp where all of the documents of the camp basically had been destroyed. That's a, a sort of a common challenge for us, but um, uh, uh, I, I always marvel at the, uh, the way our historians in particular piece together these uh, incredibly complicated evidentiary uh, jigsaw puzzles. These are the ultimate, as we say in American English, cold cases, right? The crimes took place a long time ago. There was a very a famous and successful American TV show called Cold Case on uh, CBS, I think. Uh, and in the Burger case, we actually just, uh, according to what I've read, set a record. Uh, there was a 75-year time span uh, between the uh, uh, involvement in criminal conduct and are proving that uh, in a court of law against a defendant uh, uh, in the United States. So the new record in the United States, albeit in a civil case, uh, not a criminal one, is, is 75 years uh, mm -hmm. set in the Berger case. My question is because I saw the Netflix series after contacting you. I didn't know that you're inside, you know. So I, I saw all the series just now because I read the Berger case. Um, and but the case is quite similar. You have like um, nice old people <laughs> that sound, suddenly, you know, 
or nobody thinks that they are they had they are all these criminals so how is it possible do you think these people i'm not sure are are they bad going good or are there is there something when they are afterwards living you know you mind um, it's a circumstances that makes you bad or good or what 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 is it I've been wrestling with that question for the nearly 40 years that I've been doing this work, and uh, I, I, I'm not sure I have any new insights to offer. I've questioned a lot of the suspects, including Mr. Berger. Uh, I've questioned people, well, in one case, who, uh, one person who confessed to leading a platoon of men on a mass killing operation. Um, no one has really um, explained why they did that. I, I'm prepared to believe that under more, uh, 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 under regular circumstances, a um, few of them would have been involved in, in killing operations. But I think I have to leave that uh, to the psychologists and psychiatrists. I, I will say that um, uh, when you uh, point out, you know, old men, um, we did have, by the way, one woman uh, mm. defendant. Uh, mm. That's true now. But when we started this work in 1979, uh, the average age of our suspects was, I think, around 61, 62. And uh, I hope you won't say that's old, considering my age. <laughs> But, um, uh, 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 you know, I, I well remember uh, our suspects being, you know, some of them still working. And, and uh, you know, we, when we would um, do our uh, uh, unannounced visits to uh, to their uh, homes to speak with them or try to speak with them, you know, we had to uh, be alert uh, for our own safety. Some of them had guns, we knew that, and some of them had had used guns, fortunately not on us. Mm. And do you think they, are, they have something in common? Because you're integrated a lot. I think perhaps, uh, and uh, for most of them, the lower level people, a uh, a deep uh, uh, sense that uh, they have to remain obedient to authority, but I can't be sure. Um, the, uh, the best interviews I've ever seen of these people uh, were by, um, uh, in the one case, um, uh, by a, a famous British journalist who interviewed uh, the commandant of two Nazi death camps, Uh, and then the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, uh, which uh, did a filmed interview of uh, a, a cohort witness in one of, in some of our cases, someone who uh, served in a German-led Lithuanian staffed mobile killing unit, um, and he was living in Lithuania. And they asked him some very interesting questions. You can see that uh, online at the uh, U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's website. Hmm. You know, what were you thinking um, when you killed these people? How did you do it? Whom did you kill first? It's, it's, it's difficult viewing, but um, it's enlightening. What, what, when you interview these people, do you think, do you have an instinct knowing if they are lying or not? For example, in the case of Ivan the, the Terrible, you, do you think he was it really because you have the instinct that he, he has to be this, this person or not? Well, I never, I never questioned uh, myself, John Demjanjuk, uh, but I think, you know, having questioned a lot of these people, I have a pretty good radar for, uh, uh, you know, like most prosecutors do, I would say, for uh, when people are, are not telling the truth. And uh, uh, people spend entire lifetimes studying how to, how to uh, get people to tell the truth uh, uh, through your through the way you ask questions. Um, and, and I guess I'm a, a longtime student by now of, of, of that. It's, it's partly art, it's partly science, it's partly luck. Um, but um, you know, each person is different that you interview and has to be approached in, in the best way you can, uh, you can conceive. You, do you need a special approach with these people? And is, is it another approach if you have a, like an, another kind of um, criminal there? Probably. Um, again, I, I, the, I've worked only on the human rights cases, so I'm not in a good position to compare them with others. 
Um, but you know how you approach an interview depends also on what kind of evidence you have, uh, what you have available to um, uh, show to the defendant if they start to veer off off track. Hmm. And and in the Nazi cases, uh, we often have very powerful uh, documents uh, that we can show them uh, that uh, sometimes bring them back towards the truth. Uh, I'm, I'm remembering a case that my uh, uh, then uh, my deputy Mike Bernstein uh, uh, had in which he questioned the uh, defendant who had been a guard at the Mount Housen concentration camp and the. Uh, the defendant was actually just a suspect at that time, and he was denying almost everything. And only when Mike showed him proof that he served at Mauthausen did he admit it. He said he didn't know what was going on there. You know, he was a perimeter guard. Did you ever see anybody die? No. And then Mike showed him uh, an SS record recording this person, this suspect himself, having uh, shot to death a prisoner. And then, oh yeah, suddenly I remember that, but uh, the best he could come up with was, I did not finish the prisoner off. Another SS man you know, administered the coup de grace. So it's a process, as they say, of peeling away the layers of the onion. Mm. And what, what was the most difficult thing for you to do in all these years? The most difficult thing was interviewing um, Nazi victims, Holocaust survivors and others. Um, I would say the most difficult experience I had in the work was when I was a young attorney and we went to Israel to interview Holocaust survivors, uh, three, three lawyers, uh, uh, and uh, each of us interviewed maybe four people a day. Uh, and um, for each of them uh, virtually, I would say, uh, there came a point when you realized that the next question you were gonna ask was probably gonna cause them to break down crying, usually involve uh, parents or siblings or back then children uh, who perished. And um, I remember feeling very, very guilty uh, asking that question. They were expecting it, but still uh, one doesn't like to make good people cry. Uh, and to a person, uh, when I would then say, are you sure you want to continue with this? Uh, they would say, yes, it's important. And they would. So as I say, they're, they're the heroes of these cases, but it was a uh, very, very difficult two weeks. Do you have recordings of this um, interviews of, of the victims that you use afterwards when they are not there, for example, to chase other uh, criminals? We have some uh, of the um, witnesses, uh, including survivors, uh, on uh, mostly a videotape. Uh, mostly not. Mostly not. Hmm. And my f question is also: Were um, um, were there times that your, for example, um, that there people were threatening you and your or your family because of doing this job? We've gotten, and I've gotten, uh, threatening letters, um, emails that seem to convey threats. Um, there was a time many years ago when I thought I was attacked because somebody uh, launched a full-size uh, Toyota pickup at the side of our house and, and tore down a brick wall uh, and uh, narrowly missed uh, killing one of my children. Uh, at four in the morning, uh, but that turned out uh, to be uh, teenagers. So it had nothing to do with my work, thank goodness. Oh, okay. Okay, and were there one point that maybe you thought to le to 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 um, do something else, or was it your decision to continue with this? Well, in fact, after three years doing this work, mm. um, I did do something else. I I went into um, practice of uh, corporate litigation in Manhattan at a, at a big and very fine law firm. Uh, and um, uh, that had its own frustrations. In particular, I was accustomed uh, as a prosecutor to having a lot of responsibility. That's one of the great advantages uh, to um, uh, uh, 
being a prosecutor, at least in the United States, you get great responsibility early in your career. And at a big law firm, you know, I'd be the third or the fourth person down the totem pole in our cases. So that was that was frustrating. But I I stayed uh, because the cases um, had and still have great meaning to me. Most of our work now on the human rights side involves um, uh, perpetrators, participants in post World War II uh, human rights crimes in places like Bosnia, Rwanda, Guatemala, Liberia, Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, those cases cry out for justice as well. Once again, our historians, brilliant historians, are key participants in building those cases. And uh, sometimes I think we lawyers go along for the ride, but we, we do have a very essential role to play. Are there people that you, um, uh, that you know that they are guilty and you couldn't um, uh, arrest them? Yeah, that, that's one of the, the great frustrations of the job. Sometimes you know uh, that uh, uh, in your heart of hearts that the person was in it up to his ears, uh, but you can't, you can't prove it. I remember one case where the key witness was a Holocaust survivor who knew the defendant. They had been in high school together, and the defendant, or the I should say the suspect, uh, had committed crimes in their town. So he had witnessed this, but he... Uh, after agreeing to testify, um, got frightened about it and uh, decided he wouldn't. And without his testimony, we, we couldn't bring the case. So there were any number of cases where, again, you know it in your, in your gut, but you can't prove it being, you know, by the heavy burden of proof uh, under which we uh, operate. And, uh, you know, we should be held to a high burden of proof as prosecutors. Hmm. So I, I think that do uh, I think that Daniel has to leave no soon or do we have some time still? I'm not sure if we we can because I'm not sure if because normally she said ten ten so I, I think we 10, maybe 10. have three we have three minutes maybe <laughs> okay. if you want to <laughs> right. uh, three more minutes yeah okay because I'm okay. not sure we also also will soon. I want uh, my my last question is: Do you think, um, knowing Germany now, that, that that something like this could happen again, or uh, what do you think? I think something like this could happen almost everywhere, anywhere, almost anywhere, and and um, that's particularly frightening. You know, uh, uh, one sees parallels between. Uh, Uh, what happened in the 30s and 40s and what happens today. Uh, so, for instance, Hitler utilized the, the new technology of that era, radio, to, to reach a mass audience. So did Goebbels, right, and, and spread, their, um, spread the virus of hatred, as it were. Uh, and today, um, uh, we have the internet. And anyone can reach an audience of millions and purveyors of hatred Uh, have harnessed the internet, uh, and they are um, seducing large numbers of people into, um, I would say, very dangerous uh, ideologies. Oh. Okay. I um, my last question. I hope, hopefully, it will not stop. Um, what the, we are in the pandemic. What is a positive thing for you in this pandemic? Do you see something positive? Not a lot to uh, 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 find uh, favor with uh, in the pandemic. Uh, I personally, I do like the fact that I can be at work five minutes after taking a shower. You know, <laughs> there's no commute. Washington has some of the worst traffic in the United States of America. Uh, I like also, you know, when the workday ends, I'm home for dinner. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as many people have experienced, the workday seems never to end because You're always at your workplace. Um, but um, uh, I know we all look forward to being together and, and working together. We have uh, at the Human Rights and Special Prosecutions section a great group of people, um, and it's a collaborative effort. And I think the work suffers somewhat when uh, we can't, can't be together to, to support one another in, in you know, this very, very difficult work. Mm. Okay, so thank you very much. I think we have to cut now, no? So um, I have a lot of thank more questions here. <laughs>
but we will see it some day, another day then i suppose okay so thank you very much and i well, maybe I, we'll meet someday yeah we will meet someday thank you yeah bye thank bye you.